Um, my name is Fred Adam. I'm, I'm assistant professor of architecture here, and um, I'm here on behalf of the Public Programs Committee to introduce Dave Gerson, who's running our uh, 2020 master class. Now, for those of you who don't know, the uh, master class is an opportunity. It's a research funded by European architects for us to bring somebody uh, who's doing something extraordinary, uh, really exceptional things out in the world, in the field, to come and work with our students on something that they come up with, right? Uh, to tackle questions, to bring out new possibilities or methodologies, and this is really an incredible opportunity for us as, a, as an institution to kind of uh, shake our own assumptions about how we do things. Um, to challenge ourselves by bringing somebody from the outside and working with them in this intensive, focused way. And we've been doing this uh, for the past, well, half a week now, the first week of this week. So David Gerson is somebody who is, um, it's very hard to be concise about like, him and describing him because he's involved in just so many different things. Um, but he's a, I'll just go over just very briefly, but he's an internationally recognized artist, architect, writer, and educator based in New York. Uh, he's the director of interdisciplinary learning at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Arts, where he has been a professor since 1991, and a student for the past 35 years. <laughs> and actually, uh, I was very lucky to have David as a, a professor during my thesis year. Uh, but he's also been the, an associate dean there, School of Architecture, uh, working with Dean John Gaelic as well as uh, acting here in the school. Now, he's also involved in a number of other uh, endeavors and efforts, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but a little, little note about, well, so again, master class through these workshops for the past, what's the sixth one, uh, not all of them have really been working on drawing. Right? Drawing has been a sort of main topic. And I think that there were uh, workshops that were about drawings of the world, drawings about the world. And over time, these have become drawings in the world. <laughs> and really, in this uh, sixth master class workshop, I wanted to bring David and with Frida Fulberg uh, to come and help us really explore this question of what a drawing in the world is. And we had a kind of uh, suggestion of possibility that maybe drawing isn't just some, something that has an effect on the world, but that in order to create a space, an architectural space, one has to also create a kind of proto-architecture <laughs> to then get to an architectural space. And the drawing might exist somewhere in between the two. And this prose architectural space, I'm calling it that, is, um, is a, it's a kind of sanctuary for the individual's imagination, but also a kind of collective imagination, a sanctuary for that. So if you want to have architecture that cares, we kind of have to create a space, prose architectural space, where we care for ourselves and for each other. So, um, this is, this is why uh, it's really great to have David Gerson here. And this is what John Hiddick was trying to do at the Union. And uh, this is what made that institution what it is, hopefully so. Um, and um, so, David, thank you for being here. And please help me welcome you. Hi. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming. It's, it's an honor to be here. I want to thank uh, the School of Architecture and uh, David Halton for inviting Halton for fear out, uh, for having me out here. Such an incredibly warm uh, welcome. We've been here, having an incredible time with the students, wonderful students. We're, uh, we're in the deep end of the pool. We've only been here three days. It's kind of incredible. Uh, 
as as Kira uh, just mentioned, uh, he was a student at Cooper about 20 years ago, when I, I had the incredible pleasure to work with him on his thesis. It's an uh, unforgettable uh, project. And uh, uh, you know, Kira, as you probably know, is a true explorer. Uh, and I uh, think uh, he has a giant heart and has a giant intellect. And, uh, and really, to me, Vera represents uh, the best of uh, what Cooper Union demands for a certain uh, few decades. So, it, it, uh, it, in large part, meant a lot to me to come out here and work with him again. Uh, so, uh, so, of course, I've been thinking about what I, what I could do, what I could bring to this opportunity to, to speak with you all. I'm thinking about architecture, education, space. Uh, transformation, relationships between architecture, the arts, the humanities, the sciences. I, I do work in many, many disciplines in lots of different uh, situations. So tonight, what I, I want to start with, I want to start by taking a little bit of a risk. And, uh, and I want to share with you a, a number of different little fragments, let's say, or vignettes. Uh, maybe, you know, short kind of vignettes, and I want to put them in juxtaposition to each other. The hope, in a way, is to create a kind of constellation. Um, maybe tangent points, let's say, on education, on space, on knowledge, transformation. And I want to start with the sun. Uh, it's a gigantic, life-giving fusion event. Uh, I think in some ways uh, it sets a scale to many things. This is an image from uh, Michael Benson, a, a dear friend of mine. He's a writer, a <clears throat> filmmaker, photographer. Michael works with NASA uh, uh, with satellites, and he creates uh, these incredible images uh, using uh, raw uh, spacecraft data. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, I want to share a quote from Michael. I should say, uh, you know, he's an incredible writer. He's written many, many books, a lot of them on deep space. Uh, but this, this quote that I had fallen in love with um, was actually from a really rapid fire email exchange we were having because he was about to go on a radio show and like was fluttering back and forth about things that were in his mind. Um, uh, so anyway, a quote, uh, to the effect that all of our civilization, indeed all of life on Earth, with all of its deep time evolutionary legacy, is a product of the ceaseless hosey of energy from the sun over billions of years. And that energy, in turn, permits a counter of entry, surfing in an opposite direction, from the tendency of everything to run down, roll downhill, wind down like a cock, or head downwards towards the grave, or in general, to a state of less, not more energy if you get my drift. A local and local, a local and localized reversal and effect of direction, a microclimate, wherein instead of one way towards decay, the energy provided by the sun permits an opposite tendency. Rather than nothing, something rather than extremely cold, we get warmth, life, etc. And the windings and tendrils of life extend via DNA, Spiraling between generations and back to time. End quote. So, this very intense quote gives a sense of the earth as this rising, growing, blossoming of life that's in conversation with the sun, with the sun's continuous gift of light, of heat, and energy. So, I'm an educator. I'm also uh, a father. My daughter, Sarah, is uh, she's now 16. My son, Sam, is, is uh, 14. And uh, I want to share a, a brief story that I think captures something important. Uh, so about 10 years ago, when, when they were four and six, um, every morning, I would, uh, I'd bring them to school. And I did that with this electric scooter I had. It was kind of like a kid's push scooter, adult size, paddle motor. I love that. Um, so I would ride the scooter, and I would chase the two of them. I'm sorry, it's in New York City. 
And uh, they would raise as a team against me. So it's two of them. I'm chasing them. And uh, I, of course, most of the time would let them And they had this kind of arrangement that if either one of them got there first, then they won. Nice cheap avoidance arrangement. At some point during this, we're all stuck started to block me, right? So I'm on the scooter, I'm chasing him, and he starts blocking me, right? Whichever way I went, right? They're racing as a team. I go to the left, and he blocks me to the left. I go to the right, he blocks to the right. I can't get around. But the thing is, he's doing this never looking back. <laughs> he's running as fast as he can, looking the other way, and no matter which way I go, I can't get around him. And I can't figure out how he's doing that. And so finally, of course, one day I said, oh, no. And he says, oh, uh, it's easy, Dad. Uh, wherever you go, I just run into your shadow. If I'm in your shadow, you can't get past me. He was poor. Um, I mean, it's the kind of thing you think of, you know, like maybe a pro soccer player, something like this, right? Um, so as far away as the sun is, the sun is directly implicated in creating the shadows that he was chasing. So I was blocking the life-giving sun as my sun was surfing my shadows in an opposite direction, blocking me. The counter of entropy spiraling between the generations. It's beautiful. It's a great sign. Uh, William Burroughs. I hope some of you know William Burroughs. It is an incredible, beautiful, short book. Uh, on the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And in this, he tells a wonderful story about frogs. He describes how frogs started out living in the water with gills. They didn't have lungs. And they could not survive out of the water. But some frogs, some rare frogs, had gills that for short periods could serve as lungs. And in times of drought, these frogs could make these sort of short little frogs out of the land in searching for uh, sources of water. Through natural selection, these frogs survived, and after uh, many trips onto the land, their gills transformed. <coughs> they grew into frogs. And the frogs also came to the land. So the frog, in searching for water, found land. These are some more images from uh, Michael Benson. These are uh, uh, his sister moons off of uh, Jupiter, Io and Europa. They travel together around Jupiter. This is Io. It's kind of stunning. It's a continuous volcanic uh, eruption. It's, it was covered in volcanoes, most of them active. Therefore, it's the youngest surface in our solar system because it's continuously renewed. This is Europa. Europa is literally a drop of water hanging in space, covered with a gray skin thin shell of ice. It's the largest drawing in our solar system. Michael really is like an explorer of space by using data and creating images from it. Uh, so uh, one day I had uh, Michael uh, back at Cooper Union, and he was showing his images, and we were looking at this incredible deep space image. We've seen a couple of images, I'm sure. And, uh, and as soon as I asked Michael, I said, well, which satellite was that one taken from? And, uh, and Michael said, oh, it was actually shot from Hawaii. It's long exposure. He starts explaining the technicalities, you know, the tracking equipment, six hours a night for 28 nights, and you know, how it worked. And as soon as he said, well, don't you have to be in outer space to see that? And Michael said, well, where do you think we are? It's paraphrasing about me, Fuller. He always insists that I have that, so he thinks he uh, where do you think we are? Right? We are the cosmos. 
has a very dear friend named Rambo Riviera. He's an anthropologist and photographer who's been in the architecture school for about 30 years. Uh, we come uh, every fall and do a whole series of talks, usually 12 every fall. Uh, and one year he was doing a series of talks called Subterranean. Subterranean. And uh, he was thinking about the cave drawings of 35, 40,000 years ago. Uh, and, you know, Rambo was a very thick mind. He was moving very slowly in his Italian <laughs> and, uh, and at some point, he was asking a sort of simple but difficult question, which is why? So it's like, why? Why did he go down to the cave to draw them? He said, oh, you know, it's not enough that they were running from the animals. It's not enough that they were getting ready for the hunt. He didn't buy any of the simple explanations. And he started talking about the darkened spaces of the caves and the darkened spaces of consciousness, and about a kind of equalization of pressures between these two spaces, and that perhaps in this equalization, drawing popped out, crossed over this civilization. Marks that are marks and are also something else, something other than themselves, a representation. So a drawing can be of something, but it always is something. Now, at some point, Grandma stopped, and he said, uh, he said, you know, often the story is that we transitioned from Homo fiber to Homo sapiens, and then we started to draw. He said, there's another possibility. Perhaps we found drawing down in the caves, and that's what caused us to become Homo sapiens. That's what set the transition in motion itself. Draw, representation, excess, more. So at some point, I was having a conversation with a philosopher friend named Tom Zimmer. And uh, I was telling him the story about Bremont's thoughts on, on the caves and the drawings and our evolution. And Tom asked a simple, difficult question. He said, so why is it that those drawings, those marks, appear to us as a bear? It's a very open question. Why is it we see them? What if those marks were made not by our ancestors, but by bears? <laughs> Um, of course, Tom was playing with the enigma and the humor because it expresses some deep linkage between drawing, representation, language, and the nature of human nature. Because as archaic as those drawings may be, we know that those marks were made by something that we think of as human. In fact, you could say that a bear is not a bear. It is a life form that emerged in this tiny microclimate of our solar system. At least for the bear, it prefigures language. I mean, we have named it bear. We say, oh, oh, there's a bear. That's absurd. I mean, for us, this language, this name, is now part of its fur. We see it, it we see this unnamed life form, and we see bear. Okay. So it's an question, interesting question. Can we see the unnamed? Bear and bear at the same time. Is it possible? So, I really want to share a story with you about Philo Farnsworth. Has anybody heard of Philo Farnsworth? Okay, two, three. Not bad. More than usual. Um, Philo Farnsworth invented the television in the 1920s. He was a mathematical genius. He was also a farmer. You see, one of the great challenges that they were wrestling and struggling with at that time was that in making the early attempts at television, the, the electrical impulse that was necessary to transmit an image over any distance into whatever, it would basically explode whatever it was, was received, whatever tube, whatever they're trying to do to catch the image, because the amount of energy it took for it to move would blow it up. Now, Philo had spent his young life uh, uh, in the fields. He was tilling the land, cutting rows for planting, going to the end of the water, and back again. At the age of 15 or 16, he had the epiphany of 
clear from the electrical signal of the waves into rows that could move across the screen back and forth and recreate the image by breaking it up into tiny little pieces, it reduced the impact of its arrival and it did not block the waves receiving it. Um, it could redraw the image. He called it the image dissector. It's how TVs work up until the flat screen digital television. Uh, it's how the images were sent from the moon land uh, back to Earth. So he took his embodied spatial experience of the field and found the impact, their impact, on his questions. And in fact, he rotated the horizontal geography of the land to become a vertical geography of moving images that we have so much today. This is a drawing I did uh, many, many years ago. It's called Circles. And it contains many reflections and mirrors and recombinations, and it's dynamically interacting. So each of these stories, Benson's son, Rostam's shadows, Burroughs, Frogs, Reynolds, Kids, Tom's bears, and Philo's fields, are speaking about life and transformation. In different time frames and durations, each are expressions of the transformative consequences of interaction within living systems. This is, of course, expressed in one of the core principles of the theory of evolution. When multiple agents are brought into proximity, they interact. And under certain circumstances, these interactions create transformation. Now, this is sort of a rather large idea. Proximity, interaction, transformation. Sometimes I would think of it as a scalable idea. An idea that can be brought to a number of different situations, different time frames, different structures and contexts. We can look at and think about social political transformations as a consequence of the interaction of multiple diverse agents. We can look at economic interactions and the transformative consequences of the interaction of diverse financial instruments. We can look at the evolution of technology and think about the proximity and interaction of multiple forms of technical agency. We can also look at the evolution of knowledge. I think about the proximity and interaction of multiple ways of knowledge. In fact, as I'm sure you know, the theory of evolution itself has evolved quite a bit in the last 160 years. But I wanted to begin with this large principle of evolution because I, I believe it expresses the defining characteristic of our time. Now, today, in these early days of the 21st century, the ubiquitous observation is transformation itself. Cultural, technological, biological, social, political, economic, geological, ecological transformation. We're in the midst of unprecedented violence, the articulations of our lives. And there are people and communities and institutions across all disciplines and across the globe that are increasingly confronted by the need for new models of asking these extraordinarily complex uh, questions. The huge multiplicity of interacting agents that are constituting our current transformations, it may be creating circumstances that we do not yet comprehend. Today, perhaps humanity's greatest risks lie in our capacity for comprehending transformation itself. In the deepest sense, many of our current crises, and there are plenty of crises, threats of ecological, nuclear disasters, endless wars, famine, global infant mortality, acute systemic racism in the United States, dramatic inequities in resource distribution, global main few. Many of the crises can be understood as crises of comprehension, or crises of understanding. So how do you mitigate that risk? How do we mitigate the risks if our greatest risk lie in the capacity for comprehension? I would argue education. The evolution of knowledge may contain our most precise forms of risk distribution. Education, by definition, is a transformative pursuit. Individuals who come together, they engage in transformative interactions and competitive experiences. Knowledge evolves, comprehension evolves. Perhaps, like the frog, searching 
the water to find the land, our search for new models of asking these questions, our time transformed us. So one of the things I get to do a lot as an educator, and I love to do is speak with groups of people, like I am right now. And uh, a number of years ago, I was speaking with a few hundred uh, high school students, juniors and seniors of the United Nations International School. Uh, and we were toying with some uh, ideas of perception and knowledge environments about how, how do we know what we know, where do we know what we know. And at some point I asked them, uh, I, as I went in, people told me that they had just had their finals. So I think I'd play with that a little bit. I asked them about their finals. Um, so, you know, uh, did you study? Of course, he said. Uh, did you have any questions? All the questions, no. Did you have the answers? No. So what did you study? And you know, the mind races a little bit because it's trying to find some way to express the in-between. Ideas, concepts, principles, something that isn't a specificity, isn't a question for the answer. Something transferable. So it brings up all kinds of questions about the specific and its relationship to the general or the principle. Questions of memory and communication, of how do we transform specific experiences to create some kind of transferable. transferable principle, concept, to some other specific experience. And it's kind of worth looking at the experience we call study, or study, and ask us a few simple questions like, what are we bringing into the finals when we go? And where is it? Where? This, of course, kind of different depending on uh, what the final is. I mean, take calculus, calculus fine. Where do we know calculus? Now, it turns out, according to these students, <laughs> that you can cram for a calculus exam. We would recommend it, but, you know, the cognitive experience of repeating specific calculus questions allows some people to go into the final and recognize, re recognize, recognize something specific they've never seen before. So how do you recognize something you've never seen before? So you think about this, it, like you've got, you push them all in like nights before, and then you get there, you have a bunch of them here, you see one out there, you don't know it, you turn, you look, you try to relate them, find some connection, register it, and then the present tense experience, right? You say, ah, uh, I recommend it. I can do that well. I can do that well. Turns out it's not so easy to cram for your French oral exam. <laughs> so it makes sense, right? Speech. I mean, think of all the embodied movements of air, breath, and tongue. It's, it's hard to absorb, absorb that quickly. And of course, all of the embodied pathways in neurological traffic, now you're reading all of this. I mean, where do we know French? OK, so what about the soccer Let's say you get to the soccer Now, what are we bringing into the soccer And where is it? I think of all the previous games, playing spatial you know, conversations, the feel, the legs, the ball, the calibration, registration, the alignments, the movements, the impact, kick the ball home. So it seems that the question of what we bring into the finals and where is it are really quite different in calculus or speech or in soccer. Now there's a wide spectrum in just those three. A uh, wide spectrum of mental and physical forms of experience and knowledge. Okay, so what do I mean by physical knowledge? Does anybody play a musical instrument? Nice. Yeah, there's more. There's a shot. So let's play with that for a second. Think about the violin. It's kind of fascinating. How do we learn the violin? 
you think about soccer or French or calculus. No one would expect to read about the violin or talk about the violin or the history of violins <laughs> and then walk out onto the stage and do anything with the violin. We know why, why, how do we know that? We know that. We can't simply speak our way into playing the violin, we can't read our way into playing the violin because our elbow must know it. Our wrists must know it, our ears and our lungs must know it. We must embody the knowledge of playing the violin and embody the relational knowledge of all of those things together. So the relationships between character of speech, soccer, violin, they bring up a pretty fascinating question. There's a classic epistemological question, which is how do we know what we know? People are always asking that. But we can also ask where do we know? Where is the knowledge of playing violin or skateboarding or painting or drawing or calculus or physics or speech or geometry? This is speaking to the relational nature of experience. Because we don't really experience things. We experience relationships. All experience can be understood as relations. As in a conversation. And there's a very large area of study, I'm sure many of you have heard of it, uh, looking at what is called embodied cognition. And that, in principle, is, is looking at the relationship between embodied experiences, playing the violin, some embodied experience, and its relationship to embodied knowledge, meaning knowing how to play the violin. Because somebody who knows how to play the violin. It's different than somebody who doesn't, even when they're not playing the violin, which means the embodied experience is creating. Right, a transformation of the neurological you know, like cognition. <clears throat> and this is something of interest, of course, many, across many of the disciplines arts, design, craft disciplines, obviously, the cognitive brain sciences, a lot of new technologies, user interfaces, people look at that, of course, in medicine, in the humanities, the philosophies of phenomenology, uh, the sort of the literary poetic connections, literally, life itself. Are sort of trying to understand where are we relative to our body experiences. And these questions speak to something that is essential to all experience. I would say so much so that it's often forgotten, which is the profoundly human condition of being a body. We are a body, a living, breathing organism, cognition, perception, memory, and emotion. We are a body with a great propensity to say, I have a body. My leg hurts. My voice is getting tired. We're constantly taking possession of our body through language. It's part of the nature of the body we are to take possession of itself with speech. Being a body, of course, does not deny the body that we address when we say, I have a body. The separation really is provisional. They coexist. In fact, I would argue they're coherent in space, they're coherent in experience. In doing something like playing the violin, or drawing, painting, or working in a field, or making, or yes, even make like speech itself, in language. Often when people debate this, if they're involved in the world's debating, you know, the body cognition, uh, embodied knowledge, like the violin, it appears very separate from uh, from language. I just did. I, I was saying you can't read your way to play the violin. It's kind of a classic position to take. And it's, it may be it's very true. But in thinking about knowledge and experience, about where do we know what we know, it's important to wrestle with the fact that experience is never that far from our capacity for language, for representation for recognition. This is uh, an interesting expression of that. I often will draw that on a chalkboard and then wait a few seconds. Maybe 15 seconds. And then because those were, of course, 82 letters and numbers. And now we can remember their order. So that's how we can remember 82 numbers and letters in a specific order, having only seen them for 15 seconds, right? Quite different than those crazy encryption passwords that you get. But here, cognitively, there is a uh, technical term for that. It's called chunking. Right? Um, it's a large part of how we make sense of the world. 
And not just with remembering language or cramming for calculus, but how we actually experience the world right now. There are many embodied sensory forms of chunking, tactile, auditory, visual, and haptic chunking. We're constantly buffering and filtering our lived experience in many forms of chunking. We're, we're registering our present tense experience with the past experiences, and this is happening all the time with all of our senses. I took these uh, photos uh, the other morning. One is taken, it says a tree in front of uh, our house of our such numbers. One, one is taken early dawn, the other is a little after the sun rose, the same tree, obviously. And I found the comparison fascinating. Uh, in some sense, it speaks to the relational nature of experience, light, and how we're registering it, the foreground, the background, all of this stuff. But there's something else that is part of our experience, both while standing there that morning, um, as well as here in this room, experiencing these photographs. In recognizing the tree, we recognize the tree. We are doing something quite similar to what happened with the 82 letters and numbers. We are chunking our visual experience. Uh, there's an example that helps uh, think about what I'm saying. If, if we could imagine a kind of amazing fun project, or rather than an incredible time, we will across the hall now, deep in, in the right? So let's just picture another one. If we, uh, if we uh, uh, went out uh, outside and we covered the side of the building, uh, we do that winter, right? but the paper, and then there's a tree. There's a tree there, we cover the whole side of the building with paper, and then we all get out there and we, uh, we measure every week. And let's say we really did it, like we got some fancy equipment that actually could stand it here. And we drew every leaf on the tree, full seat on the side of the building. Scaffolding, we spent 10 days, 50 days, every single day. It would be a really beautiful one. But I think we don't really look much like that. And think about the unbelievable amount of, of detail, the density of the drawing. Right? Because when we're seeing the tree, we're chunking visually, we're chunking it into groups, seeing different amounts of leaves at different moments, depending on what we notice, you know, what we pay attention to. This has to do with vision, light, etc., but it also has to do with memory and emotion. We're registering the present tense experience of the tree with all the previous trees we've experienced over the years. Like the bear I mentioned, we bring this geography of recognition to both the tree and the photograph of the tree or the drawing of the tree. So our language and our visual perception are commingling <coughs> to synthesize that experience. Uh, that's me. A little while ago, <laughs> the, the, the structure I'm sitting in is called the Draftsman's House. Uh, you know, when I graduated, uh, Cooper John you know, to just you know stay, uh, draw, write, and teach with me. I did that for ten years, and uh, I built that uh, structure. Um, you can tell by drawing. I mean, I'm sorry, by the photo of the distance of time, you know, we're gray in the year. Uh, the dressman's house is a kind of uh, inversion itself. The architects often think of drawing in anticipation of building. The dressman's house was built in anticipation of drawing. Uh, in it, you can see a, a large uh, drawing. It's one of a group of about eight very large drawings and over 200 short stories that form a, a community. Um, in this community, uh, it's a community that I was drawing and writing. It was, it was located or situated within the larger creative community of the school of, of, of the Cooper Union. Um, and so when imagining and drawing and writing a community within a community, the conversations and exchanges within the two communities are inside of each other. 
and sometimes between each other. And conversations between geometries and substances, between drawn spaces and lived spaces, between friends and imagined inhabitants of the drawn. These images are all from the same drawing, sort of just moving around to give you a sense of the scale and detail. Here's another drawing called Two Trees, one that cinema attaches itself to and one that is moved by that attachment. It's to do with the double landscape, film, life, still life. I began to inhabit this double identity, this life within the still life, and sense a kind of still life that inhabits life. We call it a living still life. And breathing in and out the literary dimensions of our lived stories, of our lived stories. In some way, in the draftsman's house, an equalization of pressures took place. Rather than talking some, accounting of entry. That includes bios and memory, emotion, language, substance, imagination. And all of these conversations were commingling, they were creating duets. Their spatial literacy evolved into a spatial literature, written and drawn and lived, with all of the nuance and imagination of, of life itself. Drawing, as I said, can be of something, it always is something. Developing our capacity to listen to our drawings to our stories is directly linked to our capacity to listen to the world. This is how we decide to be able to understand and listen to And this begins to speak of experience as relational and also as an assemblage, an assembled coherence. And this is constructed not only within us or the exterior world, but in fact between the world and our experience of it. Much of this sort of deep uh, process I describe, uh, it is structured by our evolution as a species. We know that lots of, lots of what is making our experience is coming from our senses, from all of us as a species. But our development as a species is not the only participant in the constant construction of our experience of the world. Our present tense experience of this room, right now, is directly linked to such sense of perception, but it is also inseparable from the capacity of memory, of our personal imagination, to situate us in space and in time. Our, our memory, Imagination, thoughts, language, stories, hopes, knowledge, fears, desires, all participate in the structuring of our spatial temporal experience. We largely assemble and synthesize based on what makes sense to us from all of our previous experiences. And to some extent, we actually only sense what makes sense to us. We, we, we miss. Literally, sensory, sensory, we miss what does not make sense. Language is deeply entangled in our making sense of our experiences. And in fact, we have an embodied knowledge of language itself. So we can ask where do we know speech? for this in advance, but I want you to just briefly try to imagine my tongue and all the tiny little movements that's going on. Breath, mouth, my tongue, the sounds, language, memory, movement. I have no idea. Wait a second. I mean, I must That's I'm pretty good. I'm doing it nonstop. I don't know what the same is. Here it comes, just going right at it, right? So I have an inside knowledge of the commingling breath, language, memory to create voice, to create this vibration between us. 
So this is essential. Because this is where we understand that language and many forms of knowledge are at once embodied within us, and they are co-constructed between us. Speech. Speech itself. Participating in speech. We are all participating in speech. Listening and speaking. That's the acceptance of a shared order of communication. It allows the expression of the individual thought. It's a shared order that allows us the expression of the individual thought. It's an agreement that allows us to disagree. And this emerges both within us and between us. The incredible poet, uh, Anne Carson, uh, she said, for a poet's despair, it's not just personal. She despairs of the word, and that implicates all of our lives. Uh, this is a model of uh, two trees. And then one that the cinema attached itself to, and one that is moving and attaching. And as these very words that I'm speaking right now are entering this room, they're moving between us. They are creating linkages between our individual memories, our embodied knowledge of language, and our participation in a shared order, or you could say a socially constructed form of knowledge. This is from a story that I wrote called The Film School. So asking, where do we know what we know? Is both with regard to the body, the body knowledge, the breath, the voice, the, the where is also the spaces we share, meaning the where of a lecture, the where of, 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 of an art studio, or a science lab, or the fields, or the soccer fields, or the theater, or the film theater, concert hall, meaning the where we call school. That's a where that we should ask, where do we know what we know? And this opens up the possibility of our spaces of education as sites of exploration, as spaces of emergent communicative exchanges, emergent between individuals and their social environments, their knowledge environments, their spatial environments. The limited geographies of space, they do contain all the enigmas and traps and paradoxes of language. But, and I think it's a pretty good but, space speaks in silence. The limited configure of language. Space is literal, but it's speaking in silence. So how can these geographies be literate when space speaks in silence? How do we speak of space when space speaks in silence? How do we author silence? If space speaks silence, surely we too contain the silence within us. A silence which is not the denial of language, or of time, or of history. I would say it's maybe a void which at once prefigures language, circumscribes and moves through speech. So could it be that Space contains a silence that speaks to a silence within us. And that in this communication, we find shelter. We find sanctuary. In all of its silence, perhaps space is the other half of us. Perhaps it completes us. It builds us as we build it. Gathering together the past and present experiences into the body that we have and that we are. The silence of this communication does not diminish the capacity of space to be literate. Space has the capacity to at once situate our individual imagination and construct the spaces between us, binding together our humanity. The space between us. The space between us and our works, the space between us and each other, may constitute that displaced place we do call home. An authorship that is grounded in the silence of space may ultimately have the capacity to construct a multitude of living stories, living still lives, that at once shelter and structure 
the living spaces of our personal imagination, and they constitute the broad coherence that we call the social contract, the spatial social contract. The spatial poetic imagination, I would say, is in fact a dimension of human life. It's a language of empathy and difference that includes our nuanced fragilities within our shared stories. In this sense, <clears throat> I've argued that I worship a lot of them very intensely uh, on the idea that the spatial and poetic imagination is perhaps our most pragmatic means of addressing our social lives. The poetic imagination, the they afford a means of comprehending our fragile world. And it's, they produce oxygen, let's say, within the fibers of our social contracts. For an architect's hope, not just personal, she hopes space, and that indicates all of our lives. If you pile dirt and rocks on paper and leave it overnight, and it rains, and then you carefully lift it up, you get the sun. So the earth and the rain make a draw of the sun. This is a work done in Arts Letters and Numbers. It's a, a nonprofit arts and education organization that uh, founded about eight years ago with a wonderful group of people from all over the world. And we did this uh, with a sense of uh, urgency. Urgency for what's possible when we create new structures and spaces for interaction and creative exchange across a very, very wide range of uh, disciplines, ways of knowing, modes of expression and action. And we uh, collaborate with and hold workshops in educational and cultural institutions worldwide. And we hold an ongoing series of, uh, of educational workshops, sessions, residencies, music, theater performances, events, exhibitions, film productions at our mill located in Maple Park, uh, New York. One of the hopes and, and missions of Artsiders and Others is to create uh, circumstances of a giant diversity of ways of knowing brought into proximity and So disciplinary diversity, cultural diversity, age diversity, biodiversity, gender, race, and social economic diversity. A kind of microclimate of diverse voices and forms of agency, broadening the spectrum of experiences, creating what we hope is a kind of living system of knowledge transformation. At our center's numbers, we often create spaces of interaction through the dynamic structure of questions. So as an example, if you ask a physicist about light, they may say something like, oh, it's the structure of the world. If you ask a photographer about light, they may say something like, well, it's the structure of the world. If you ask a painter, Ask an astronomer, ask a filmmaker, a biologist, an artist, a solar engineer, thought about life. And of course, it makes sense if you think of Michael Pence's quote Life is fundamental to all forms of life. That's why it moves through so many forms of ways of knowing, knowledge, and expression. While a painter, a filmmaker, a physicist may all uh, see light as the very structure and fiber of their work, it's pretty interesting that light for a filmmaker and for a painter may be understood as fundamentally different. That's meant to for a physicist. So each summer, uh, we have our summer programs. We have an astounding group of people come from all over the world and share questions and, and, and uh, works. Over the years of our summer programs, we've had hundreds of people from dozens of countries uh, and as many disciplines. 
that our closure numbers often in just a, a few week period will have actors and architects and minds and neurologists and filmmakers and physicists and mathematicians and musicians, writers, welders, policy makers, chefs, dancers, attorneys, painters, ping pong players, performance artists, magicians. And together, we uh, ask and they have the questions. We share and co-construct works. In one of the uh, one of our early uh, workshops, uh, maybe the second one, uh, we started with a series of questions about the dynamic interaction of disciplines, ways of building new linkages, uh, and we said, well, what if we could build a bridge? Uh, and literally build a bridge, but one between disciplines. So, uh, can we build a bridge that is a stage, that is a drawing board, that is a film screen, and that is a bridge all at the same time? So we said, well, how do we do that? How do we construct that bridge? And so we said, okay, well, we have to start, uh, we have to start by digging vaults. This requires, you know, we've got to excavate. And uh, uh, that, you know, uh, then we got to pour foundations, and we got to raise the structure and new horizon. Right? So we set out to do those steps. We started digging, digging, and uh, digging. And we started to discover things. And uh, while we were digging and searching. <clears throat> we started to play, <clears throat> and then we asked a simple and powerful question. What is excavation in drawing? So we're digging, we're spending half the day digging, and then we're saying, what is excavation in drawing? Or what is excavation in writing? What is excavation in film? What is excavation in actors? What were pouring foundations? Great line, pour concrete, pour foundations. We say, well, what are foundations in acting? Foundations in film. Or in drawing. The foundations in film. <laughs> then we're going to raise the structure. We're all collectively working together, body experience, shared, constructed in body experience, raising the structure. What is structure in drawing? But what is structure in writing? Or in acting? And then, of course, raising the horizon. The structure in raising the horizon is, of course, the connective tissue between all of us. So what I wanted to share here is this kind of unfolding of questions. I mean, body shared experience that then blossoms into many different ways of knowing that people have insight, they have an embodied experience. And it, it, it mingles and creates a conversation with the shared experience. So new works, new questions emerge in running after what we don't know. In running after the unknown, in this microclimate of ways of knowing. This is a project uh, that we did in Denmark in 2012. It was a drawing board film screen for about 200 people. It started uh, with a, 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 a proposition question from uh, the great philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, 
uh, Emmanuel Levinhaus beautifully articulated uh, this point that the, the most heightened sensation of the human condition occurs between two faces looking at each other in silence, prefiguring before that. He, 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 he believed it was the most mysterious face in Hunter Solders' book. He also believed that it was the origin of empathy and consequently ethics. And he must, it's a beautiful life's work on, on ethics emerging out of the recognition of another's life before language. And then it, of course, grows through language. So we wanted to sort of work with that question. The young ones, my son, not the beard. Uh, so we uh, we built this huge arc for the wall. We skinned it with paper, and then um, you see uh, this is a theater space. The curved wall in the background. You see the drawings. <laughs> Uh, basically, each person was asked to go out into uh, Aarhus, it was a very good town, um, and, and, and go to a location that they had uh, some kind of an emotive relationship with, some memory, and to capture it, and to bring it back. <laughs> capture it in drawing, in any way, it could be Polsia Prabhu, drawing, and something where they had, they had a present sense of experience capturing something from a previous uh, emotional relationship. They brought them and they placed them uh, all around the outside the walls. And, uh, and then uh, we broke into a, a team, the pairs, group, groups of two, right? You see Love Your Nots right there. Now, if you're on one side of the wall, right, so, so she can't see her drawing anymore. Because it's on the outside wall, but he can. And so he has to reenact her drawings to whisper through the wall to her. Because her only access to her memory is him. So there's an emotional interdependency that emerged out of the Levinas. We took the Levinas composition, we introduced an opacity to the communication so that it could be a tissue, a tissue that would connect the whispering to the wall. So now, if, 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 if I can see your memory, and you can't, I have called into question. Right? I have a, an imperative to try to precisely whisper it through the wall to you. So that led to all kinds of inventions uh, of, of, of ways of doing that. It's a parallel edge that's being moved from the other side. All kinds of communicative exchange. Then we introduce live feed film. Uh, you can see a bank of, of, of projectors. Right? Now, on the other side of the wall, on the outside, was a bank of a, a, a bunch of cameras, and they were they were cued to each other. So each camera was, was speaking directly to one of those projectors in live feed. In a way, you can think of it like the two heads were now doubled, and they were still there, but there was a camera and projector as well. And that, of course, really changed the dynamic as we just experienced today. Those of you in the room, we see what happens when we start to deal with multiple cells. So you can see, you know, she, the G, the image, is on the other side of the wall. When she turns her head back to look at her drawing, that's when the camera catches her face, and in fact, it turns towards her. It takes a little while to get used to the memory, right? I call it a 21st century loving not, so I have to look away to look towards. They're drawing together in my plan. Watch this one. Because what happens is you move into it. After a day, 
you start to look happy. <laughs> slight crack between the projector and the camera. Uh, this next one is to me a kind of stunning uh, emotional moment. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God, we have to miss the stunning emotional moment. <laughs> Wait. Kind of a clip. And it's led to all kinds of, uh, I don't know what to say, the social poetic gestures that uh, the tables. Uh, each, each, uh, each discipline, in a way, is affording us uh, distinct modes of, of, of thinking and acting. I, think that, I mean, in relative to perception, comprehension, engagement. And I would say one of the things that I've been working on since we founded our social numbers is, is um, you know, in, in, in evolution and in biology, there's a, a principle of polymorphic. Polymorphic essentially means uh, that something can exist in different forms depending on its immediate environment. Molecules are polymorphic. Language is not. And uh, the idea that disciplines are. You know, polymorphic, if you take a crystal and you throw it in one bed of crystals, it will grow differently than if you throw it in a different bed of crystals. And not just its shape, it doesn't, not just the way it looks. I mean, its crystalline structure is, is transforming relationally to its context or environment. And so the idea that if you bring, that there's a dynamic disciplinary job, so if you bring different relationships together, they are polymorphically uh, interacting. So, see, now I'm going to have to adjust the sound. Let me try. Uh, so, I want to share a couple of uh, collaborations, because like most one of the things in my part, letters and numbers has really been built uh, in conversation uh, with, you know, with many different people in many different communities really kind of sharing uh, hopes, imagined futures, and working to, 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 to build them. Um, and we found often that the collaborations are most fruitful when they're not over curated. And when we don't necessarily know what's going to happen. I always say this, this it's not a lot of rules in our social numbers. But one of them is if we know what's going to happen, we don't do it. We want time. Um, so we very lovely to collaborate with uh, great people, institutions, you know, regionally, nationally, internationally, and I want to share a couple of them with you. Uh, this is a, a project. Sorry. This is a project uh, called the uh, Galapagos in the Sea. This is a collaboration with the uh, RISD, the RISD Museum, the composer and musician Michael Harrison. Uh, the Black was created with over 40 RISD architecture students, uh, with uh, Terry Riley's console uh, in 1964 PC. Uh, uh, the piece was a series of sort of call and response listening and speaking with the paintings in the RISD Museum's uh, Grand Gallery. Michael taught 40 architecture students the vocals to be able to vocalize Terry's in C. So the modules that we 
this is a, a, a project called Which Way is Home? Uh, it's one of a series of projects uh, that we've been really fortunate to uh, collaborate with uh, incredible theater uh, directors uh, at the uh, Long High uh, School of Theater Ensemble, Ward Dales, Washington Teal, Larry Moore, it's my alma mater, my old high school in Albany. Also working with Youth FX, it's a, a local uh, nonprofit film arts uh, program, incredible work that uh, they're doing. Um, Share with a little bit of this. Such a blessing to not just be a part of this program, but to watch it step by step, no matter how big, no matter how little of a step. Each and every moment was a gift. To see them fully become themselves, to fully allow themselves to break down, to allow themselves to take down that wall and become something else. Uh, that's my uh, great grandfather. 
And uh, when I was 14, I bought that, and by the time I was 16, I did that. Um, this Harbor uh, Freight Mentor work is being led by Frida Fulber, who is here tonight. Frida is the Associate uh, Director of Large Service Numbers, and she's a Regional Coordinator of the Harbor Freight Fellows Initiative on the area. So speaking of cultures of craft and Frida, uh, at ALN we found uh, food to be a remarkable way of bringing people together. This is uh, largely due to Frida's love of, of, of food and, uh, and people, and she's developed a, a practice that engages uh, many elements of, of uh, food and performance and uh, human interaction. It has a multi-year uh, project titled Why Are We Eating Together? And I think it's quite incredible, it's a wonderful, joyful, uh, healthy, uh, beautiful, delicious dimension to our collaborations and our sort of Like language, food uh, gathers us together. And this can contribute to uh, new forms of communication, new ways of asking, I would say, even the most challenging uh, questions. This is, uh, I want to share a project that uh, we did in collaboration with um, UNICEF, with the Office of Innovation. Uh, UNICEF, uh, I've been very lucky to participate in a number of different uh, policy debates uh, on a lot of issues with uh, education and other ones, a lot to do with the sustainable development goals of the UN, uh, institutions uh, and organizations that are working on, on these largest challenges. Uh, Going back to something I said earlier tonight, uh, the idea that the, the, many of the crises are kind of understood as crises of, of, of comprehension. Part of this work has to do with not trying to find different answers to the same questions. That's really, for me, part of the hard work uh, of looking at often seemingly intractable challenges and searching for new questions new ways of perceiving or comprehending the situation. And that can lead to previously unimagined approaches or actions. So our collaboration with uh, uh, UNICEF is a great example of this. The Office of Innovation is founded by uh, Chris Fabian, uh, Erica Kochai in 2006. They do some of the most important uh, and interesting work that I've seen. Uh, they have a network of innovation labs in, in dozens of countries, uh, primarily low infrastructure regions, often in crisis zones. They work largely with young people, 12 to 25 year olds, to create innovative approaches to strategically improve the lives of children of life. These young people are often working on challenges that are specific to their geographical area, the situation they're in. Uh, and when they uh, develop approaches that work, um, they have a significant impact. The Office of Innovation um, uh, then scales them. Chris Fabian founded the first venture fund within the UN in the history of the UN. It's obviously a nonprofit venture fund, but it operates in a similar set of mechanisms. Much of it is in crypto, if any of you are interested in that. Um, and they, they then scale it so that it, it can impact the whole region. As an example, they, they helped build the largest mobile health system uh, in the world, in Nigeria. It's reported on uh, more than 17 million births using SMS. Uh, some of the fascinating work they're doing has to do with adjusting resource distribution lines dynamically based on live time information coming in on births. 
Right? So knowing the location and timestamp of millions of births, there's something like 9 million births a year go unregistered in Nigeria. For somewhat obvious reasons, it's pretty damn hard to get to the registration center if you're in extremely challenging situations. And Chris essentially invented a way with one touch on any flip phone, it sends a message, baby born, at the location. And then they give the flip phones to all the midwives. It's right out. And then they re articulate the delivery system for early life nutrients in a lifetime. These, these ideas weren't even possible 10 years ago. Um, I'm going to turn the volume back down. It's working. So the project that we collaborated with uh, on is part of an ongoing project that I have called Information Poverty. Um, it began with the idea of looking at information and communication as resources. Literally, communication as a resource itself. To be considered in terms of scarcity and abundance, like many other resources that the UN needs to have eliminated. In terms of risks and opportunities. Now, as with many resources, there are significant inequities in the distribution of access to information and communications. These inequities often align with other patterns of inequitable resource distribution, creating conditions where whole segments of society are at risk and their feet totally left behind. So uh, two winters ago, we held an immersive workshop up at the middle of ALM to try to open up these questions. We started by reframing the question. We said, well, instead of information poverty, let's look at communication scarcity. In fact, we called the project Scarcity in the Age of Distributed Communications. Some of you might hear Benjamin Britt there. And we brought together about 40 people, uh, both from uh, uh, UNICEF as well as a lot of different NGOs, uh, organizations from international development. So we had policymakers, mathematicians, computer scientists, economists, but we also had poets and musicians and writers and chefs and minds. Minds, communication, the body, the body communication, communication as a resource, scarce or abundant. One of the areas that we focus on are schools. UNICEF has a multi-year project looking at schools worldwide. They've surveyed well over 300,000 schools around the world. And part of this is looking at which schools are in communication with which other schools, right? trying to understand right? that, that thing. Uh, a large aspect of this has to do with information technology, of course, as we know, right? Uh, and, and, connectivity, digital communication. But as there are many schools and areas that are not connected at all, that don't have any information technology. So we're looking at other forms of communication, radio towers, newsletters. These surveys lead to all kinds of dynamic big data maps, as you can imagine, in schools, who's going to be who. In some ways, the schools can be seen as nodes themselves, right, within a communication network with the potential of sharing knowledge and information. But if you look closely, we can also begin to perceive other layers to this job. This is why I believe that when I, when I work with policy leaders, I need monitors. Because schools are nodes within information networks, but they're also, and primarily, gathering people together, physically, into close proximity. Meaning, they're nodes of embodied human interaction and communication. And it's important, it's important for many reasons, having to do with sharing stories, having to do with culture, <coughs> having to do with the fact that um, this embodied communication may also help us understand the way something like an epidemic or a pandemic. William Burroughs said, then the sleep of language is a virus. Well, viruses are also a form of language. So they often communicate between bodies in close proximity, and they are distributed through the nodes of embodied interaction. So Chris and Fabian and the other generation look closely at the human nodes gathering people together, reveals a lot about flow. 
So with that perception, you can overlay many of the forms of communication and resources, including information, viruses, vaccines, into a multi-layered dynamic matrices. And you can perceive whole different sets of flows, develop new approaches to stemming the flow, right? In fact, you think about almost kind of, it's, it's, it has to do with like leapfrogging, it has to do with acupuncture, it has to do with recognizing that it, the, the virus might flow like a river, it might flow like information technology, it's like communication, and then you can start to work them against each other to diminish the pandemic. So you can imagine this work is deep, what it does, it resonates beautifully with the mission. All right, so there's numbers, bring this together, diversity is now going to open up a new question. Often, the search for the new questions has to do with language, the language you're using to frame the question, express the question. If you think of the earlier point I said about seeing a bear and the word bear, recognizing the truth, how do we recognize what we have not yet experienced or even imagined? This is what I'm trying to get at. How do we ask what we did not yet have the language for? How do we react to the unpredictable when it comes at us over the horizon? What if the unpredictable is an epiphany that is emerging within us or an understanding? How do we care for that? How do we listen to it? How do we not push it away or ignore it? Or, as is often the case, not even notice it because it doesn't make any sense to us. So we do not sense it, we do not perceive it. How do we run after what we don't know? What we can not yet speak. And I'm going to share one last part. Uh, this is a uh, collaboration we did with the Central Academy of Fine Arts in, uh, in Beijing. It started. Uh, uh, with, uh, yeah. It started with the students and teachers coming to each other's numbers from Beijing, uh, and we skimmed the entire interior uh, of our barn of the each other's numbers with paper and we created a full scale rubbing, uh, mixing the maps of uh, New York City and Beijing and the barn. So we were mixing. Uh, you know, it will mark its texture with these two cities. And then um, and then we brought the paper bar, we rolled it up, and we uh, we brought it to Beijing on the flight. It was sort of barn in a suitcase. So, um, and then we, we brought it there and created an installation in the Cotton Museum, it was part of this large summit they were holding. Uh, part of what we were trying to do was, because uh, they were looking at cultural exchange and education, and part of the gesture of having actually come to the barn and engage visibly in that was, and then physically you bring it back, right? And the other groups, I knew they would all bring thumb drives. 
I said I want to bring them to the bar. Um, it was really to emphasize that culture is more than information. It's people, it's material, it's stories, it's viscous. It's part of um, uh, this sort of uh, uh, the, the, the sense of a, of a kind of body transference of cultural understanding. Part of why I want to share this tonight is this the question of embracing the unpredictable. Um, because we knew we were going to do that and make this installation very beautiful. What we didn't know until we arrived there was that we were going to be presenting, the, they, they asked us to present the power window of Beijing arm raising, right? And they said, oh, you have to do it in this. They showed us this gigantic, crazy thunderdome, a uh, jumbo prom. And we had like four days or something. Um, so we had to kind of react quickly, and I just wanted to share it's like 40 seconds of what we did. A map is a drawing that's always losing information through scale and resolution. So to make a map that captures everything is to make a map as big as the land. Sciences. We have an ethical imperative 
to whisper through the walls and search for new forms of communication, interdependencies, new forms of interdependencies. Because really, the truth is, there's just way too much at stake, and there's too much that is possible to continue to use the same language to formulate the same questions. Changing the world literally means changing how we understand it how we experience it, how we speak it to ourselves and to others. This is why I believe that teaching and learning are arts. And to a large extent, they're listening arts. Listening is a form of imagination, a form of ethical reciprocity. Listening to the unheard voices, searching for the unknown linkages, really to create transformation, to create the transformations that embody our best hopes and aspirations, to create the outcome, transforming how we are experiencing today into how we will experience tomorrow. Thank you. Why do you think, David, we have empathy for the present, empathy for those we can see our own humanity in, but we can't extend that out to the earth, the globe, you know, the living thing that is earth, um, and to our children's 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 children. What is it about the present that stops us from projecting empathy into the future? Because we can project an idea of the future, but why can we not project empathy into the future? Is that a, 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 a mean question? Not at all. It's a beautiful question, a giant challenge. I think it's actually kind of central. When, 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 I'm, when, I'm, when I'm wrestling with uh, you know, the imagination, mm -hmm. we're always situated in the present time. Mm -hmm. And the present is largely built from in the sort of balance or commingle of memory and anticipation. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the beautiful question is, if, you know, if we're anticipating, mm -hmm. can we extend an empathetic imagination into the anticipation of the future? Seems like a relevant question for people who build the environment like architects. I would argue that you could define, you could say architecture itself is the anticipation of inhabitation. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Architecture is? Architects are anticipating inhabitation. It's both, right? Both the architecture and the architect. And so this is why I often uh, argue that, you know, there's a the classic debate that I'm sure goes on here or somewhere else. You know, is it an art or is it a science? <laughs> And I love that debate. I grew up in that debate. Uh, the truth is, I think we know it's both. I think it's more one or more the other, depending on the situation and on the questions being asked. I would argue there's something more important, which is its footing, its foundation, is the humanity. Because that is the imagination of the other. That is where the anticipation, if you say it's the anticipation of the habitation, you're saying, it's the imagination of an adaptation. It's the imagination of the other. And in order to grow that, in order to broaden that spectrum of how we imagine the other, the future others, we need to have the footings of what we broadly call the humanities. Um, the other thing, because in your question, also like, why can't we now? And I think that's a very important thing. And it's, I don't want to. I don't want it to sound like I'm going to answer like, well, this is what we do. But 
I would throw out a, 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 two other things next to each other. I've been recently working on ecology, ecologia, and economia. Ecology, economy. Echo, what they share, is a can take a number of different forms. It's a version of home, it's a version of place, it's a version of house, echo. And logia is a version of story. The logic of you could say, but it's also the story of. So ecologia, in principle, means the stories of the house, of the place. Nomia, economia, is, the, is number, obviously. The counting, sorry, the counting of the place, meaning the, the counting of the story. So for a very, very long time, ecology was understood as the stories of our place, our environment, and we could have a relationship to talk about. I would argue that in probably something like the last 500 years, you could say four to seven, depending on how you want to find it, I'm talking about the birth of modern banking, um, we have economy of the counting has been taken for the place, meaning mistaken for the place. We believe that the number is the house. A lot of my work is in that. I, I, I do a lot of work in finance and you know, market functionality and the way in which that maps the bear, the fur of the bear, you see a bear, you say bear, the language is in the fur, the way in which market functionality maps and obfuscates our relationship to the ecology and the stories of the house. So I think there are there are social political and social economic reasons, neoliberalism as a broad, you know, brushstroke. And there are even, I would argue, there are logical reasons, meaning in terms of perception, right? The masking of an ecology of bioeconomia is not only political, it's cognitive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry that was such a long That's like, go down. Any other questions? Thank you for your patience. Oh, <laughs>